Aloha and welcome to another edition of Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about association living. I've said many times about 400,000 people or a third of our population live in an association in Hawaii and this show is designed for board members and owners to understand the opportunities and obligations of living in an association. Now today's show will be a little interesting because we have a guest from the mainland on the show via Skype. I've never done that before. And so this will be a little bit of a challenge for us, but we're gonna have with us today, Don Bauman, who's Senior Vice President with CAI regarding government and public affairs. And a good friend of mine who's been to Hawaii and done seminars here, because we're gonna be talking about federal issues. We often talk about our legislature and the things we're doing in the state legislature. I thought it might be really insightful for everybody to learn more what's going on on the federal front. So let me welcome my good friend, Don Bauman to Condo Insider. Welcome, Don. Thank you, hello, Richard. It's great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me to join you. Well, I've got to ask, where are you and what's the weather like? <laughs> well, it's, it's never as good as it is in Hawaii, but we're lucky. We are having 70-degree weather here in the Washington, D.C. area when it's supposed to be in the 40s and 50s. So we are having a warm spell. Maybe it was in anticipation of this, uh, this opportunity to Skype with you tonight. I'm not sure, but we're having great weather. Thanks for asking. Yeah, well, we wish you were here with us because you're always enjoyable to be with. But... You know, a lot of times locally here, there's a misunderstanding of CAI or Community Associations Institute. Can you generally talk about how big you are and what you do and, and, and the perception that maybe it only represents management companies or lawyers, that kind of what your base is? Can you just briefly tell everybody a little bit more about CAI? Sure, I'd be happy to. So Community Associations Institute is a, an organization, a nonprofit organization. We've been around for um, just more than 40 years. We have 34,000 members around the country, around the U.S., and around the world. We have 60 chapters around the country, and um, a couple of them outside of the U.S. as well, Canada, South Africa, and the United Arab Emirates. And those locations are growing as well with more coming on internationally. Um, and the organization is an educational and advocacy organization for people who govern associations, so the board members, and people who manage associations. Um, I would say about a third of our membership is made up of volunteer leaders, board members of associations. About a third is made up of, well, let me, let me actually correct that. About 40% board members of associations, 40% managers and management companies, and about 20% are the business partners that serve those groups. So education and advocacy are primary, um, are primary services that we offer to members. Well, since it's true that a lot of the legislation, state legislation, it must be a challenging job to keep up with all the differences. I'm sure all the states aren't one size fits all. I mean, uh, I gotta believe it's gotta be very challenging to keep up with the differences in the various states. Well, it's interesting. So there are 50 states in session this year. So all of the states right now are in legislative session, and we're monitoring about 1,500 bills throughout the country that have an impact on community associations, condominiums and homeowners associations. Now, the good thing is there is a uniform act that um, was created by the Uniform Law Commission. It's a bipartisan um, group of attorneys in, uh, out of Chicago. It's a national organization. They're based in Chicago. And they create uniform acts for everything, for building codes, for um, um, for all kinds of matters, di different kinds of matters, mediation matters, um, family and domestic matters, a variety of matters. And there is a uniform common interest ownership act. It is a state-based act that is a really well-thought-out piece of legislation that affects all the different areas of the governance and management and operation and development of condominiums and homeowners associations. So that's probably the best resource for legislative bodies to look to when they're looking at take, making legislation to impact community associations. I know that I have uh, regularly used your research and your data you've collected from all over the states because we, like any other state, have leg legislation every year on a whole variety of issues. And I found that the, your resources and the work you do uh, in government affairs and public affairs has been very valuable to us and also educating our legislators 
uh, what's being done around the rest of the country, although we in Hawaii always think we're different than everybody else. Uh, I would tell you the issues often are quite the same, but how they're handled. So I thank you for all your effort in that area. What I'd like to focus on today is we often on this show talk about local legislative issues. And I want to just mention, I was down at the legislature today, and, and our producer here, Zuri, asked me to say this, so I will accommodate her, otherwise she'll cut me off and you'll never see me again on the show. But anyway, when we were at a bill, one of the big issues is education of board members and homeowners, because we, like most states, get all these complaints by some group that says that living in an association is unfair. But uh, the bill was to require mandatory education for board members, and of course they're volunteers. Well, they, uh, in this particular bill mandating education, uh, they deleted that, but did state that they wanted the Real Estate Commission to be required to put on their website the Condo Insider Shows as a resource to local owners and board members here, because they felt that the one-on-one, -on -one, the people we brought on the show, really gave our board members and owners real information about living in a condo. So thanks to Think Tech Hawaii and our staff here, uh, we're very proud of that accomplishment. That being said, I know that there's probably a half a dozen issues uh, on the federal side that we don't often talk about here. So let's talk about some of the priorities on the national level and the federal legislation. And let's begin with what you guys call housing finance reform. Tell us about what that issue is and kind of what's going on there. Great, thank you. So housing finance reform has been an issue that we've been looking at for years and, a, and an issue the federal government has been looking at for years. And what it means is how do people who live or want to buy in a condominium or homeowners association, how do they get a loan? And the, the whole housing finance system, you know, really um, there were some significant changes made to that system back in, after the... Um, the housing bubble in 2006 to 2008. So there were a lot of changes made to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, and some of the federal, the federal regulations, and some of the oversight of banks and what banks are required to do when they loan to people who are trying to get a mortgage in a condominium and a homeowner association. So this is a huge issue for a lot of different stakeholders, like the mortgage bankers, like the American bankers, like the realtors and the home builders. And for us, we only make up about 23% of the housing stock, stock around the country. So for us, it's an important issue, but what we focus on, what's very important is, what are the requirements or the obstacles for lenders to make a loan for people who want to move into a condominium and a homeowner association? And believe it or not, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA, they all have their own regulations that are specific to how a lender can make a loan in those in a condominium or homeowner association, what their requirements are. So we are watching housing finance really closely with the narrow focus of making sure that just because we live in a condo or homeowner association, you don't get treated any differently than anyone else trying to get a loan. I will say the one thing that's different in that um, we hope you're treated differently in that when a lender evaluates an, a prospective buyer's ability to repay their loan, we hope that they include the homeowner association or condo association assessment in that evaluation, that monthly evaluation of identifying what it, whether that individual buyer is, has the ability to repay that loan. And that's actually federal law right now. Um, which I think is helpful to, so that we don't see the defaults that we saw back in 2006, 2008. So that's housing finance reform, and we're just watching it. Congress is super slow in dealing with housing finance right now. They've tried for the last two or three years, and nothing has changed, nothing has passed. Um, but there are some significant proposals we expect to see this year that um, will be in conversation for the next couple of years. It will have an impact, I believe, on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's future? Well, I know in general terms, and I, I think we're on the same point, um, to get federally guaranteed loans, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac type loans, 
you have to have an association that's qualified. And there's this condo questionnaire or qualification form. And it used to have all sorts of requirements with owner occupancy, reserve funding. And so I assume that's what you're talking about. And, and that there has been reform to improve that for associations, allowing them to qualify and open the market to more buyers as far as the, the questionnaire. Is that correct? And that's correct, that, yes. And thank you for um, digging deeper into that because that's exactly what it's about. So the federal government, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA, they look at an association through a condo questionnaire or a HOA questionnaire, exactly that, and they identify what they believe is an important way to assess the financial stability of that condominium or homeowners association. And what our job is and what we pay close attention to is whether they're assessing the proper thing. So if they're coming up with an arbitrary rule about, let's just say, um, reserves, for example, if they were to say every association needs to have um, you know, 75% reserves funded at all times, well, that's arbitrary, right? We want to make sure that um, the, what they're putting out there has some solid, um, quantifiable, and evidence-based um, requirements that can really, that's really practical. I remember going to a seminar in, I want to say it was Florida with the Association of Professional Reserve Analysts, which is a, another organization on reserve studies. And this is back around 2008, 2009, when this housing crisis happened. And we actually had representatives there from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and I even want to say the IRS, talking about reserves. And because it was so new to them, they didn't have a clue really what this was all about. And they were talking about legislation and requirements that were just totally unrealistic. So. I can see your job is to have a heavy educational role for these government agencies so they really understand what the issues are. So we have effective legislation, not reactive legislation, which has no basis to uh, help anybody, you know. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. So other than we, we know the housing finance reform is, is important to it, certainly for every association, buyer and seller and owner, there's another bit of discussion about what I'm going to call which should be very dear to the people here in Hawaii. It's called disaster relief fairness. And it has specifically to do with FEMA. And, and as you know, FEMA comes in and helps. But in a lot of ways, they can't help associations because of the way the current law was drafted. Can you share with us a little bit more about that? Sure. So you laid it out perfectly. It's the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And what it has to do with is the current statute and regulation specifically says that community associations are not, well, it doesn't specifically say that, let me rephrase that. FEMA interprets their regulation to say community associations don't qualify for FEMA funding in the wake of a presidentially declared disaster for any assistance. And typically, I'll use the example of debris removal because that's probably the most typical um, requirement that an association has is when there's a hurricane or a fire or, um, or, or anything like that, tornado, that creates a, an obstruction of access to that community association. Yeah, I want you to hold that thought because we're going to take a one minute break and I want to hold that thought. I have some more questions about it. But we'll be right back on the air in one minute. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Hello, I'm Michael North, inviting you to join us on The Art of Thinking Smart every second Thursday at 12 noon here at the beautiful ThinkTech studios in downtown Honolulu. I'm guest hosting for David Chang of Wealthbridge. Now we're talking to Hawaii's most intelligent, accomplished leaders about what makes them successful in their professional lives. By absorbing their practical wisdom, all of us can think ahead, think deeper, and become more successful ourselves. We look forward to seeing you on The Art of Thinking Smart.
Well, we're back to Condo Insider. We're very privileged to have Don Bauman, Senior VP of Government and Public Affairs of CAI nationally out of Washington, D.C., you know, actually uh, in uh, Falls Church, Virginia, talking to us about federal legislation. We briefly talked about the housing finance reform where associations that qualify for government-backed loans have these questionnaires, and they're out there fighting for us to make sure that financing for associations doesn't dry up. And we were discussing disaster relief, where the current FEMA regulations basically for a homeowner association wouldn't be able to provide funds for disaster cleanup from all the trees falling down. And of course, you people are all in these associations pay taxes and are probably feel you should deserve the same level of benefits. Is, is that a good way to sum it up? And where does it stand in the legislative front right now? That's right. So, so that's the argument we make to legislators to let them know that community associations and neighborhoods that are not deed restricted, deed restricted community associations, HOAs, they should be treated the same. So what happens right now is FEMA will pay for debris removal in a, in a, homeowner or in a uh, neighborhood that doesn't have a homeowners association, but not for a homeowners association. It's their misunderstanding that funds are collected for homeowners by homeowners associations for disaster recovery. And that's clearly a misunderstanding. Now we have the support of a number of members of Congress on this particular topic. Several legislators have introduced bills previously. Um, they just haven't moved forward as quickly as we'd like. I think that's been more politics than the issue. Um, this year we have a bipartisan bill that we expect to be introduced in the next couple of weeks. A uh, representative out of South Carolina, they just endured a terrible hurricane in um, earlier this year, and Representative Nadler from New Jersey, who is still reeling from Superstorm Sandy um, from a number of years ago. So we expect that bill to be introduced, which will just specifically clarify community associations are eligible for FEMA funding in the wake of a presidentially declared disaster. Well, it seems only fair because we pay taxes, number one. Number two, it's a when you have a disaster, I was in Hurricane Aniki in 1992, and I can tell you debris removal was a huge problem. That associations deserve the same type of help as everybody else gets who's suffering in that disaster. So uh, I would just suggest to our audience, tell your legislators to support the bill for equal disaster recovery and relief. For, and, and I think it's always important that people tell their legislators what's going on, because if they don't hear from us, uh, they don't react. And uh, it's very important. Another thing that came up, which is a little bit misunderstood, and I think it's been resolved to some level, is in homeowner associations you have these ham operator antennas, and the original belief was that having these would help during an emergency, a disaster, and relief. But of course, you know, it's like the guy, I want to have an antenna, so I'm going to erect a 100-foot tower on my, on my property. And so there's a whole lot of discussion and legislation opportunities on this. Bring us up to date where that stands and, and what the issues were. Sure. So this is definitely a special interest, um, special interest piece of legislation. So the Amateur Radio, radio Relay League, they're the ham radio lobby, um, they have been pursuing legislation for years to try to bypass local municipal ordinances and homeowner associations um, covenants so that they don't have to deal with those covenants at all. They can just, without asking anybody and without any rules and restrictions, they can put place a ham radio tower or antenna they're choosing at their time. Um, that's the way the bill started a couple of years ago. We, and then unfortunately, um, the, the couple, the, the gentleman who's really pushing this bill, Representative Walden out of Oregon, he's a ham radio operator. And he is now chair of the Committee of Oversight in the House of Representatives that hears this bill. So the bill has already passed the committee, without question, and has already passed, um, is, it has already passed the House. It is going to be moving on to the Senate. Um, the way the bill reads now, though, we were able to negotiate, similar to a, an antenna, um, a, a television antenna, the community association can have um, can have reasonable restrictions and rules. Um, the antenna cannot be placed on common property, and the individual who wants to place the antenna must have prior approval. 
Um, the, one of the um, qualifications is the association rules may not preclude the installation of a ham radio tower or an antenna on its base or um, generally. So if the rules are too complex that the ham radio operator just can't install anything, it's not going to hold up. Um, but otherwise, I think what we're going to see happening is, I guess, is something is going to pass uh, in the next couple of years, whereby associations will not be able to prohibit the installation of a ham radio antenna or tower. Now, we should also, I want to express that ham radio antennas can be wires. They don't have to be the big, huge antenna that we see, um, you know, from miles away. It can be wires, and the association can require that technology be used so that it is not um, a, a significant eyesore on the community. But it can't be so restrictive that it's cost prohibitive for the amateur radio operator. Well, it seems like on a, on a general basis, the problems you have nationally might even be a little worse than locally. That. You get well-intended legislators who want to do things to help, but they don't really understand all the issues. And if we don't have our industry organization teaching them and educating and working in a positive way for a resolution, because it sounds like you guys have done a really good job of, of cleaning that up to make sure that associations can preserve their aesthetic interests, and at the same time letting people who have, for example, an interest in ham radios to also be able to do their thing. So it sounds like you guys have done a good job and we're moving in the right direction in that area. Well, and I'll say, thank you, I appreciate that, but I'll say, you know, there were two senators who are responsible for making sure that associations were represented, um, and those two senators um, are Senator Bill Nelson from Florida and Senator Schatz right there in Hawaii. He was critical to our efforts in making sure we had conversation, and then we came back to the House, um, and uh, Representative Eshoo was very supportive in the House of Representatives as well to make sure associations were represented. So we may have to call on Senator Schatz again to help us out if, if we feel like uh, things will change and, and we're not getting the rights that associations deserve. So but Senator Schatz was critical to these efforts. Well, because we only have a few more minutes in the show, I'm going to deal with my favorite topic, and that always has to do with tax relief. Of course, my proposal was if you live in a condo, you don't have to pay taxes. That's not going to go anywhere. I know that. But I know you have some strong initiatives to try to help mitigate this with homeowner tax relief for associations. Can you describe that initiative and kind of where that's going and what we're trying to do? Yes. So thank you. Um, and we, I agree with you. Listen, we are double taxed. We're living in associations. We're paying, we're paying association assessments for some municipal services, we're paying the local municipality taxes, we're paying federal taxes, and we're not getting the same benefits as everybody else because we're paying our association to handle uh, half of those municipal services. So we're with you. Um, the tax relief bill, it was introduced last year, it didn't go anywhere last year. I'm not sure how it will be, um, how it will move forward this year, but very briefly, the way the bill works is, um, if you live in an association, and you um, have an income of less than $100,000 approximately a year, you can deduct up to $5,000 of your community association assessments from your tax, personal tax liability. Um, again, that bill has not been reintroduced this year. It may or may not. We expect to see tax reform pretty significantly this year, and that will be where there's an opportunity to pursue this, um, this treatment. So we're just kind of waiting to see how things um, fall together when it comes to tax reform. Well, it sounds like these things have long lives before they get enacted. You have a, a lot of work every year in the follow-up year and the follow-up year to get things to happen. I'm sure like in Hawaii, I think we had like 3,000 bills introduced in our local legislature, 157 affecting associations. It sounds like this is a long, slow process and you got to keep pounding away at it. issues than it is federal legislative issues because they go on and on. You're exactly right. Um, and it, that's why they say it could take an act of Congress and they mean that like it could take almost moving a building to make something happen. And that's how it works, which is, um, which is unfortunate. But. 
You know, one of the things in general terms, I know we only have a couple minutes left, in general terms that I'm going to call it, and I read it all over the U.S., not just the Y. There's this group of angry people out there who just seem to argue that self-governance is bad and associations don't know what they're doing. And there's all sorts of bills that try to interfere with the basic principle of self-governance. Do you see that nationally? And what do you think causes this anger? I know you've done surveys that reflect that people are generally satisfied. So kind of your last comments on why we have all these angry people out there. Well, here's why. Because we have 68 million people in this country living in community associations. Uh, that's a lot. It's a lot of people. You know, so people also, you and I know, be, because we've been around for a while, we understand how associations work, right? We understand that why you pay assessments. We understand how the board works. And, and now you have new people who are, you know, people who are constantly moving into community associations, and it's really not well understood how that association works and what that is, that there are rules and covenants and what those are really for. Um, so I think we're seeing, we're seeing one thing. There are so many people living in community associations. We see about 80% of people living in community associations are happy. So that leaves 20%. 20% of 68 million is a lot of people, right? So you have a lot of, if you, those people are unhappy and they're calling their legislators and they're calling the media, it's still 20, it's still a lot of people. It's only 20%, but it's still a lot of people. Um, and those people organize and get themselves, um, they get themselves involved and advocating for property rights. Well, let me thank you for all you do on behalf of the association. I hope you'll come back to Hawaii, you and your husband, so I can buy you a glass of wine, and you know this business can drive you to drink sometimes. But anyway, we want to thank you for all you do for our industry. I hope this has been insightful for the people watching, and thank you all for watching Condo Insider. And we'll be back next week, Thursday, 3 o'clock, with another exciting guest. Again, aloha to Don Bauman.